Center of mass. Let's start with a demo. This is a demonstration of the center of mass. This is just a piece of foam that's been cut out to a random shape. And then I've identified the center of mass by this red dot. The important thing to note is that an object, an extended object like this piece of foam, when it's flying through the air, its center of mass behaves as if it were a point particle. And we'll describe a, a nice parabolic trajectory as if I just threw a ball um, in the air. Okay, the center of mass. How do we find it? And the answer is right here in the slide. Just a couple of slides on this and we'll be done with this chapter. State the position of the center of mass. Um, if we have two masses and we have an x direction, so let's take x direction toward the right, and we have the position of mass 1, call it x1, and the position of mass 2, call it x2. And we want to know where the center of mass is between those two. Well, you might say, is that the place where if you put a, a rod to join the two and the rod was massless, where you'd put your finger and it would balance? And the answer is, is yes. So, um, but how does that center of mass position depend on the masses themselves? And you might say, well, it would make sense to me if these two masses were the same, the center of mass ought to be right smack in the middle. And you'd be right. And you've all done this before. You can take a, uh, an object and find the balance point. So, but what if one of the masses is, more, is heavier than the other one, say M2? Then you might say, well, that would shift the center of mass over toward mass 2. And so, for example, with this pen, um, it doesn't balance quite in the middle because it's a little heavier on this end than it is on this end. Same thing here. And in the extreme limit that this mass 1 is, is, has zero mass, then the center of the mass of the 2 will be right smack in the middle of, of M2. It all makes sense. And how do you get that out of an equation? Um, and the answer is that the center of mass position, x center of mass, that's what we call it, is M1 x1 plus M2 x2 over M1 plus M2. It's an example of a very general form for finding averages, uh, centers, um, where you weight the two positions by the masses. So this is where the mass of the two uh, objects comes into play. Um, the center of mass will be closer to x2 if m2 is bigger than m1. That would just say that this weighting is heavier than m1, and if m1 is 0, uh, x1 won't even come into the equation, and you just get uh, x center of mass equals x2. So that's how you calculate it, and you might say, well, how do I find the y center of mass? And I would say, how about this? Just like that. You follow the same procedure. And you might say, well, how do I, what if I have a third mass, M3? How would I add that in there? I say, it's just pretty straightforward. M1x1 plus M2x2 plus M3x3 over M1 plus M2 plus M3. Just like that. It's pretty neat. And you'll find, once you get some experience on this with the homework, that the results will, will make sense to you intuitively. Finally, I derive the velocity of the center of mass. Now we're interested in, uh, like in the demo, we showed the, the foam ball uh, that was spinning, but its center, that red dot, just did a nice smooth trajectory. How do we find that velocity of the center of mass? And this is how we do it. And this is a derivation. I'm asking you to be able to put this together, but you, but you all can based on the, your knowledge of the earlier concepts x center of mass. That's just what we wrote down. So what is the change 
in the center of mass. That's the final minus the initial um, as we move from one place to another. So object 1 is moving with the displacement of delta x1. Object 2 is moving and it has a displacement of delta x2. So I can take this equation and take delta x center mass equals m1 delta x1, because the mass is not changing, just the x, plus m2 delta x2. But notice now that we can um, find the position of the center of mass as per the definition of the um, instantaneous velocity of an object. And this object in this case is the center of mass of the two objects. So by concept 3-4, the instantaneous velocity is going to be the displacement divided by the elapsed time in the limit that delta t goes to zero. Well, if we substitute this result into here, then all we have to take is this guy here and divide everything through by delta t, because I've just got this divided by delta t. Well, notice now, if we divide this guy by delta t, we'll have to divide delta x1 by delta t. Well, what's delta x1 divided by delta t in the limit that delta t goes to zero? That's just the velocity of mass 1. So that's where this comes from. Delta x2 divided by delta t in the limit of delta t goes to zero is v2x, uh, the x component of v2. So this is the formula for the velocity of the center of mass of uh, a two-mass system. And you say, well, how would I extend that to 3? Well, just add on m3 v2, v3x plus m3 on the, in the denominator. And this one also has the same basic structure notice that this one does. If you're going to find an average uh, value of x, you're going to mul multiply it by a weighting factor of m1, weight, w-e-i-g-h-t, m1 times one of the, uh, times x1 plus m2, x2 over m1 plus m2. Same thing here, except now we're talking about a velocity. m1 times v1, x, plus m2 times v2, x, divided by m plus m1 plus m2. So it has the same basic, these two equations have the same basic structure. All right, so now we can actually um, go back to the problem with the, the man and the woman pushing off from each other. What is the initial velocity of the center of mass of this man and this woman? Well, they're not moving initially before a push off. So both of their velocities are zero, and so the velocity of the center mass is zero, and that makes good sense because you say, well, pfft, neither of them's moving, so their center mass is right somewhere between their two bodies, and that makes sense that that, that would be zero. What about finally? Well, we worked out what the man's final velocity would be. It had to be negative 1.5 meters per second, and we had an x direction that looked like that. And the woman's velocity was given to us. And if you plug the numbers in, and, and you have to include a few enough significant figures, but m1 v1x, that's her final velocity. 54 kilograms, her mass, times her final velocity, plus m2, the mass of the man, times his final velocity, it was negative. And these two terms, you check it yourself, you might want to use a few more significant figures than what I have here. These two terms exactly cancel each other. The momentum of the woman is toward the right, and the momentum of the man is toward the left, and those two momentums cancel each other. Now, just a little word to the wise. Um, although momentums cancel each other, energies never do. If you wanted to add up the total energy after the push-off for the man and the woman, that total kinetic energy would be 1 half m1 v1 final 
squared, that's for the woman, plus 1 half m2 v2 final squared. You say, well, wait a second. Don't you put in a minus sign because that man's moving to the left. And I say, no. Kinetic energies are always added up positively. One way to realize that is even if you did put in the negative velocity here, you have to square it, and a negative times a negative is a positive. 